Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Hello and good evening. My name is DJ Patel and I'm pleased to be today's moderator for today's session at the Commonwealth Club program focused on Jake Ward's new book, The Loop, How Technology is Creating a World Without Choices and How to Fight Back. This program, somewhat ironically, unfortunately, due to COVID and Omicron is virtual, but at least we're able to do it through all this technology. And that's gonna be one of the things we're gonna get into. But here at the Commonwealth Club, where I serve on the Board of Governors, they're actually, we're starting luckily to be able to get some uh, in-person programming. And it is fantastic. Our in-person events are picking up in the months to come. And I encourage you to learn more by going to the club's website at www.commonwealthclub.org and following them on Twitter at CW Club. I'm pleased to welcome Jake back to the Commonwealth Club of California to discuss his new book. The focus of the book on how technology, artificial intelligence are working to limit the choices we make as humans is a subject that's really critically important to me personally. But to begin with, let's just have some quick housekeeping items. Um, if you have a question to ask Jake or me, but really should just ask Jake, um, put it in the Zoom chat. Of course, you can always follow along with Jake on, on social media, um, on his Twitter handle, uh, at by Jacob Ward. Did I get that right, Jake? You got it. Yep. Awesome. Or you can follow me at D Patel. Um, but today we're going to be here on the Zoom on the Zoom channel. So maybe to start, Jake, because there is so much to get into. Yeah. And, and first, I, I just want to say congratulations on, on getting this book. And Thank for you. those of you... It's, it's available on all the usual places. I strongly encourage you to get it, especially given the, the, the conversations that are timely at hand. But maybe to start, Jake, I remember how you and I first met, which was actually at a session that I'd been trying to wrangle people to talk about ethics. And I remember the insightful, just great questions that you were asking. And now I read the book and there's so many dimensions that I hadn't even thought about that you've been hmm. able to br bring together. And so congratulations on doing so much. And I, maybe just to start is you're a technology correspondent. You cover everything. Why this subject of all the things that are the, you know, of this, of the matter of today. Well, I really appreciate it. First of all, DJ, thank you so much for doing this. I, when they told me that you and I were going to be in conversation together, I was like, Oh no, he's so smart about this stuff. And I remember being such a piker when I first talked to him about it. Oh God, he's going to blow me out of the water. So I'm really flattered that you are uh, here and taking such a personal interest in this. Um, and I remember very well uh, you and I first meeting and talking about this stuff. And and um, and that was at a time when I was having a, a couple of, of parallel experiences and they, they really set off the book. So one was um, I had just done a documentary series for PBS uh, called Hacking Your Mind. And through that, um, we went around the world and met all of these scientists who were studying human behavior, studying the patterns in the unconscious decisions we make. And one of the big findings of the last 50 years, and this is best popularized through the work of Daniel Kahneman, who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, which I know you know about, um, you know, is this idea that we have these two brains, these two cognitive categories, essentially. One is a a fast thinking brain, an instinctive snake, stranger, and fire detection system. It grabs calories off trees without us thinking about it and gets us out of a burning building, you know, without having to coordinate our movements, right? It is an incredibly useful thing that's kept us alive for millions of years. They think it's about 30 million years old. Then there's your slow thinking brain. Your slow thinking brain is a very new development in the history of our species. It's probably only something like 70,000, maybe 100,000 years old. And it is what got us thinking, what else is there beyond calories and snakes and strangers in this fire? And got us on our feet and exploring the world. And out of that has come all kinds of stuff, art and law and politics, right? All of these invented human systems that are part of our higher society. So all of that is in this PBS series. And 
I got to then go meet all of these people talking about this. And one of the big findings is that the vast majority of our decisions are being made by our instinctive, fast thinking brain. Even the decisions that we think we are using our higher cognitive functions to, to accomplish. At the same time, I was meeting folks like you who were turning me on to this world of data science and pattern recognition algorithms. And while I wish to God, and this will be one of our themes tonight, that there were lots and lots and lots of people like you who had been you know, trained in this stuff and then deployed it for good, right? As the chief US data scientist, unfortunately, I was meeting lots and lots and lots of people who did not have that goal. They were instead about making money using pattern recognition systems. And I had a very transformative evening in which I sat in a, uh, basically, I, I went to a dinner party of a bunch of entrepreneurs. They were young app makers. And it was pizza, no, I think it was Indian food and beer, and a very chill kind of atmosphere. And most of these folks were trying to deploy this stuff in the service of some really nice things. There was some money-saving apps, there was some exercise apps, you know, stuff sort of for that. But one of the things that they had come together over was a lot of them used to be behavioral scientists in some form or another. And they were really interested in learning the latest behavioral science and trying to bring it into their work. So we were sitting there and we had this presentation that night. And I, you know, I went through all the process of saying, listen, I'm a journalist. Anything you say tonight is going to maybe end up in a book, you know, careful. Nonetheless, I got to witness this incredible thing. So these two addiction experts, these PhDs, come up in front of us and describe their findings around addiction and the habituation of uh, compulsive action. And they, for instance, described a study that they were really interested by in which if you took people who had been addicted to cocaine and used to do it in nightclubs and you then and they had since gotten sober and you bring them back to a nightclub you thump the music in their ears and you flash the lights out on that of the nightclub and then you show them a mirror with baking soda on it and you say this is baking soda and you make sure they understand that and then you ask them on a scale of one to ten how much would you like to do this baking soda i don't remember exactly the methodology but it was something like that people absolutely want to do a line of baking soda anyway and the reason they were telling us that story is because they said once the habit is built into the brain it's just there. And the human brain, it forms these habits so thoroughly and it's so, you know, and, and can be so compulsive. And the, the moral of the story was, it's fantastic news for you in your business. And that's why we are here tonight offering you and, and anyone you know, our services as addiction experts. And, and at one point they were asked, well, is there any kind of company you wouldn't work for? And they said, and I quote, I'm quoting here, uh, we don't want to be the thought police of the internet. They were absolutely agnostic about what they were going to do with this. And they said that a lot of their colleagues uh, from the program that they had studied in were now working for the big casino companies. So I'm having this experience of meeting, you know, of, of learning about the patterns of human behavior, learning about the raw systems that we have developed, these, you know, very powerful pattern recognition systems. And then I was finding this weird in-between world in which very qualified behavioral scientists were looking at the patterns in human behavior and the patterns in our circuitry and trying to make businesses out of them. And I realized, oh, geez, I think I got to write a book or do something with this. And so that's why I got into it. It's, it's, I mean, it's amazing. The, the book, I mean, it starts with this, you know, really, it's just a mind trip because you start by talking about time scales and, and what time is really like. And if we think about it, of how short of an existence we actually have, as you pointed out with our, you know, our fight or flights versus our higher order functions and, and how much technology is changing. Uh, and this, this first loop, I think, is, is, is really as you're describing it, this, 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 this systems, I'm wondering if you could go into a little bit of that because you go, this is almost like, I want to describe it almost as like Oliver Sacks meets Wired Magazine. Ooh, ooh I, I like that. <laughs> right? It if, is you, like, if you could write that and get that published in some place that I can then put it on the cover of the book, that would be really excellent. Thank it, you so much. It's, it's like, it, it, it is this like unvarnished view of like, wait, am I in control? Mm, and yeah. and I, I, maybe could you talk a little bit about like what your favorite sort of unnerving finding 
about sure. who we are as humans to, to, could you go into that? Yeah, sure. So, so uh, the, the, the concept of the loop for me is like you say, actually three loops in the book and you know, uh, everyone wants to beat up their own work after they've read it. And so I'm not sure if I did it again, I'm not sure I would, I, I think I'd do a better job of articulating these three loops, but here's how, here's how I, I came down to it was there is basically a, a loop in the middle, which is the loop of our unconscious decision-making. Again, this system one, fast thinking brain versus system two, slow thinking brain kind of cognition, right? That is the central loop. Then there are, there's a, there's a modern construction. And this is the second loop, which is this sort of manipulative set of business models and mechanisms that we have deployed to take advantage of that first loop. And these are things like cigarettes. You know, it is stuff that plays on our, uh, you know, gambling is another one that plays on our, on that circuitry to make money. Now, the third loop for me is what's going to be made possible by artificial intelligence. And when I'm talking about artificial intelligence here, I'm not, you know, I'm talking just about pattern recognition systems and the ways in which we're going to start essentially behaving in response to manipulation and analysis by businesses. Already we can feel it, right? I'm, I can't find my way from place to place anymore without Google Maps. I'm totally beholden to Google Maps. And that's starting to change the way I drive, the way I navigate, the way I make plans with people. And as that movement pattern is, is analyzed by businesses, this third loop is taking form in which pretty soon I'm not going to know how to do anything except follow Google Maps around. Um, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who's trying to become a pilot, and he was saying that they still insist at the FAA that you learn the manual system on the flight computer of how to calculate where you're going. And all the young pilots are like, why would I do that? I just want to follow the blue line. I don't need to know how to do that, right? We are losing a set of, of uh, choices and, and abilities that I think we used to have. Now, well, I think one of the examples is if you Google, um, uh, you know, GPS and cliff, it's shocking how many people ignore yeah. their, their higher level thinking functions because they, the car said, turn right. And you drove That's off right. a cliff. That's right. So here's, here's an example of one that I think is the bigger picture that we're looking at here, which is, so you'll remember there was a, an incident in 2017 in which, um, uh, a flight out of Chicago was overbooked, as so many are, and a doctor on board refused to give up his seat and was beaten up by Chicago aviation police. And it made the news and the United CEO had to apologize. And these days, they are paying a lot more money to people when their fl flight is overbooked. I'll tell you that right now. At the time, somebody said to me, they asked this question that I then went on to investigate, which is, why, why did they choose the people they did? And how did that decision get made in the process? And it turned out to be this parable for what I was talking about, which is it turned out that the computer, basically, they, they tried to get everybody to volunteer to get off the flight. And people would not because the last flight out of Chicago, nobody wanted to give up their seats. That was that. So they offered a certain amount of money. Nobody said yes. Second round of bidding. Nobody said yes. Finally, they said, okay, then we're going to choose names at random. And those people will have to get off. They choose these four names. And three of those people dutifully get off the flight. This guy, Dr. David Dow, he's a pulmonologist. And he says, I can't get off the flight. I've got rounds in the morning. I've got patients to see. He was right in the end. You can't, you're actually not supposed to take off a, a doctor who's on call the next day. But something about, and there's a whole parallel. I talked, to, I talked about all of these in the book. I talked about all these different experts who could, if they were sitting on the plane, could have said, careful, everybody. This is the moment where you will all abandon your critical faculties because they will have told you a system has chosen people at random. And right there, anthropomorphism kicks in. The technical term for attributing more sophistication to a system than it actually possesses simply because you don't understand how it works. And, and everybody in the chain of command down to the aviation police are just told, this guy's name was chosen by the computer, get him off, right? And I went and looked at like, how do they cho choose the people? Oh, it's because of, uh, do they have status on the flight and how recently do they buy the ticket and blah, 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 there's all this stuff. But nobody was talking about that. All they said was computer says, get them off, get them out of here. And everybody abandoned their critical faculties until the aviation police, you know, they beat this guy up. He had to be hospitalized, you know? And for me, I'm just 
seeing over and over again the ways in which our brains are uniquely vulnerable to being given a verdict by a system we don't understand and how desperate we are as the gate agent that night was not to have to make the hard decision does not want to be the person to sit, stand there and say i'm sorry sir you are getting off or i'm sorry you are getting off instead says computer's going to choose for us and we're going to see that in hiring we're going to see that in loan making we're going to see that in who gets bail and i don't think in the same way that you and I can agree, we don't know how to find our way around anymore, right? And people are driving a, right off a cliff using their GPS. I think when the computer says, hire these people, you know, these people are kiting, you know, are, are uh, committing fraud, whatever verdicts we ask AI to render for us, it doesn't matter if it's right or not. We're going to believe it because that's what our brains do. And we, I think nobody is, has, has taken that adequately into account and regulators certainly are not thinking about it yet. And I think we have to rethink how we consider our vulnerabilities to these systems before we start deploying them on generations of people as we're about to. It's, it's interesting because that example in the book, you also come to the defense of the, of, of the, the aviation flight police. I, I think that's what they're called. So Could that's you, right. Uh, they, in fact, they sue. So one of the officers sued the, um, uh, the Chicago Airport Authority, I can't remember what it's called, but the, the, aviation, the Civil Aviation Authority, whatever it is in, in Chicago. And he, at the time, was made fun of by like local newscasts, you know, another spurious lawsuit, you know, of course, he's trying to, you know, hand off responsibility for this. But in his lawsuit, when you read it, it's so interesting. What he says is, we were not adequately trained to know what to do when we are told to get a, a non-compliant passenger off a flight who's been chosen at random. And so, you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't think he was reading, you know, uh, the cognitive people that I, you know, was reading. I don't think we came at it for the same reason, but his instinct was the same as mine, which is, wait a minute, I didn't have the faculties or the leverage or the anything. And he just understood that like the system had everybody in its grip. And, and terrible decisions were made as a result. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and for me, I, I do, I have sympathy for him, not least because I think we're going to see over and over again in all these agencies, right? Let's think about, um, you know, uh, I was just talking to somebody the other day at NBC News who was talking about the difficulty of hiring. Um, uh, this was somebody who worked in, in an industry in which, you know, they, they would love to be able to hire people that the AI doesn't think is qualified. And they can't even they don't even have enough people on staff in the HR department to go in. Nobody's got time to go in and say, wait a minute, you know, this person actually is really cool in all these other ways. If they're, if the, if the check boxes are not checked, then, you know, by the, the pattern recognition system, you know, then that person's out of the running. And so I am, I'm, I'm deeply sympathetic to anybody these days who says, wait a minute, why are we doing it this way? And shouldn't we think about a different way to do it? Because I think the profit motive and the incentive structure is going to make it harder and harder for us to do it if we don't stop, you know, if we don't slow this process down now. And we see, I think, in policing too, is, is if an officer questions decision, they're fired also because of some form of insubordination. And so it's almost like you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. And you can you can get the human gets fired, but there's no accountability is one of the things I've taken away from, hmm. you know, the loop structure that, that, that the way you've you've articulated it. Well, I appreciate that. And I think I think you're absolutely right. I just think, you know, there's very little incentive to push back against this stuff. Now, I, I want to say here, you know, I, I mean, I want to be I, I, I am trying to push back against this whole thing because I think it's really scary. I also think that there are, in fact, some really extraordinarily positive uses of some of this technology, and 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 some of it can, I think, be great. So there's a, a very fascinating guy named Michael Knapp who runs a place called Green River AI. Um, he's way out in the woods in Vermont, uh, working by himself, and and he has a team there. But you know, he's just he's off the beaten path, and he he only works with nonprofits and. Um, some he'll do some hospital and health work, but he has these very high standards for himself about who he will deploy AI on and with. And I was running my thesis by him, you know, that we're going to lose human agency over time if we don't rely on these systems. He said, man, I wish I had that problem. 
you know, is like my people aren't moving fast enough on this stuff. If I, if only they would grab onto AI the way that for-profit companies had. He said, for instance, if you gave me every birth certificate in the country, and I could just feed it through a machine learning system, um, you know, a GAN would kick back at me every apartment that needs to be repainted to avoid lead poisoning in this company in the, in this country. I could save millions of years of life. If you, if you gave me that opportunity, but I'm not allowed to do that. Or he said, in social services agencies, they, a person comes in and applies for help, and then we find the services for that person. He said, it should be the opposite. AI should look at the available resources and feed them to individual cases, go out and find individual cases. But we're not allowed to do it that way. You, you're not allowed to, to approach somebody that way. So the problem, I think, is that nobody's making money taking lead paint out of apartments. Nobody's making money matching social services people with the unhoused. Uh, we are making money on gambling, right? We're making money on addiction. And I think AI has an incredible capacity to, in theory, amplify our slow thinking brain, our sophisticated moral brain, right? This is the, the thesis, in fact, of a new book by Daniel Kahneman, I, I was so disappointed by that book because I wanted to say to him, yeah, but nobody's making money doing that. They don't want to sell to system two, to the fast thing, to the slow thinking brain. They want to sell to the fast thinking brain. They want to sell to the, your instinctive systems that can't help, but, you know, get angry and mm -hmm. make a rash decision and the rest of it. So huh. to me, it's about capitalism that I worry about here. Well, it's, it's a great one because I think, you know, what we've seen in the early days of data science is the potential power of, of, of using data for, for frankly, good. Uh, you know, uh, the one that I think about is, yeah. you know, given this recent fire in New York City, you know, one of the early cases in the Bloomberg administration was how they were cleverly using data to identify which buildings were likely to have lots of problems because of complaints and calls to you know, the, the city and they just, it wasn't like they did machine learning there. They just took a list and they said, who's got the most complaints and let's look at the, the places nearby. And so they could prioritize the, the police inspector or the, the fire inspector's time to be most efficient and effective. It, it almost seems like government it, it is not, and I think also think about like medical errors in hospitals like, is it, is it purely economics? Is it, because like, I think about all these do-gooders who want to go into these fields, what's holding them back from, from taking, giving agency to, to um, forces of good, for lack of a better yeah, term? Right, right. And I, I do think, I think it's money. I mean, I just think it's money. It is, a, it is much, much harder and less profitable to do what you were describing. And I, and I, I, that is not to say that people aren't going to to be able to do that kind of stuff. You know, like there's fantastic, you know, I, I, I meet people every so often who against all capitalist instincts have uh, decided, you know, I'm going to make a, a business that does X, you know, I'm going to work my brains out to do a, you know, I, I met a kid the other day who um, wanted to subvert the cash bail system by creating a whole alternative sort of, you know, I mean, and, and, it, and it was a, it's a, you know, it could be a huge moneymaker, but his whole purpose was to try and do away with cash bail because it, it is a deeply unethical and, and uh, unequal system and, and falls most heavily on the poor and all of this stuff, right? But those people are very few and far between. And I think that, that you know, I also, you know, I, I one of the difficulties, and I, I know that you have encountered, I assume you have encountered this too, and I, and I want, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it as well, is you know, there is a tremendous culture in Silicon Valley and in technology in general of convincing the people that work in that industry that the work they are doing is for the better, is for, the, you know, a, a greater good. It doesn't really matter what they're doing, making chairs, making vape pens, the line from the, the, you know, HR people who tend to be referred to now as people and culture kind of people, right, is, is you're doing good works in this world. And so I think a lot of people actually spend a huge amount of their time being convinced of that. Also, you know, in some of the biggest companies, they refer to, uh, you know, the people in that line of work as, as 
scientists and as you know the and the 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 corp, you know they don't call it the headquarters anymore they call it the campus right there's a there's an academic veneer to how some of this is is done that i think draws people in it makes it very difficult for me as a journalist to have a frank conversation with them and that's putting aside the fact that this these are the most secretive companies in the world that you know when i talk to my colleagues at nbc who cover the military you know or cover the pentagon right they they People will talk to them endlessly, not necessarily on the record, but they will talk to them endlessly. It is incredibly difficult for someone in, as a journalist to, to, to speak to people inside one of these companies. And by the way, anyone listening who would like to speak with me, I'm very good at keeping a secret. I would love to speak with you. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Like, like, so I think there are many, many incentive structures built here that are going to make that that make it difficult for people to make good choices. And I would also like to point out smart, very, you know, much smarter people than me, people like you, you know, there's a guy, like a, a, um, a brilliant uh, uh, woman named Meredith Whitaker, who was inside Google. She's now a consultant to the FTC. She's working with Lena Khan. And she made, you know, she was one of the very first people to say, it is not okay. I mean, t- thinking here about what you're saying about like p- trying to push back, trying to raise your hand, say, this is, this is a, a you know, not okay, that it is not okay in sar- inside certain companies for someone in the position of being a data scientist to even ask what their work is going to be used for. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day uh, at, a, at a, one of the big five tech companies, four, six, whatever there are now, uh, who said um, that if you ask too many times, you immediately get fired. That it's a, it's a, if you ask, you know, what is this going to be used for? too many times they let you go. You know, so I think it's a really complicated landscape in which to create any kind of groundswell of resistance to this kind of stuff. Um, hmm. And I, I worry about that, right. I would say. Yeah. So, so for those that are just kind of joining us, we're, we're in conversation with uh, Jacob Ward and his book, uh, new book, uh, The Loop. And we're going to start taking questions in a bit. So um, I encourage you in the Zoom chat to ask them here. And you should definitely be following Jake on Twitter and other social media uh, at by Jacob Ward, B-Y, Jacob Ward. Uh, you know, let, let the, the one that you're talking about in these corporations and transparency, I think, is a great jumping off point because uh, jumping into point uh, around national security. And, you know, some of these companies are talking about, you know, the need and the desire to work on, on national securities, given the complex landscapes, questions about Western values and what's being put into these systems. China is aggressively going after surveillance technologies. We've seen AI being used to break into systems from Israeli companies. It's a very complex landscape. And if we, the, our classic argument is if we don't do it, somebody else yeah, will. That's right. How, how, how do you square all these things as you look across, across the complexity of the world and that, honestly yeah. preserving our lifestyles? I know, I know. It is such a, a vast and important subject. And maybe that's the next book, right? But, but I think that the, so first of all, that thing of if I don't do it, someone else will is one of the great traps of this world. Whether you are someone who, you know, I've I've had people say that to me who work in national security related products, making surveillance systems. Uh, you know, I've and I've heard that from people literally who make, uh, you know, uh, highly addictive casino simulators uh, designed to ensnare old ladies. Uh, you know, that way of thinking that someone's got to do it and might as well be me. I can do it a little more ethically than somebody else will is, is a real complicated thing. And that's a common thing. Now, national security. So you're, it's, I, you're it's amazing oh, that we have to start god. with the sigh. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, it's so complicated, right? Like right before the pandemic, I was in this. I, I was just about to go to China to try to do a whole series for NBC about this because it's and and one of the conversations that we were having about it is is the language that you have to use in order to speak to chinese officials about this stuff uh and what i wanted to do essentially was go there and say okay you have the exact same technological capabilities arguably even more sophisticated technological capabilities and an entirely opposite worldview political worldview and and what does what would our lives look like if we were living in an authoritarian environment in which um, stability and control was the priority as it is in China. And it's so fascinating to, to, to talk about that then with people here in the libertarian West, uh, you know, West Coast, 
I was at a dinner where someone was giving a presentation on the Chinese social credit system, where you have to register your, you know, like at by Jacob Board, you got to turn that those credentials into the government so they can monitor what you do online. And if you don't behave properly, if you post something about Tiananmen Square, or worse, if one of your friends posts something about Tiananmen Square, your credit score goes down and you can't get a loan. And eventually you can't ride trains. And eventually you're basically a prisoner, a prisoner in your house. You know, they were describing that system and the effect it's having on social cohesion and this, that, and the other. And after the presentation, the room was divided. Half of people said, uh, wow, that's a nightmare. And the other half of people said, we should totally have that here in the United States. You know, there is an there is a, a way in which the most textbook form of communism, you know, and and where and authoritarianism and where it goes, and the most wild. Uh, form of of libertarian tech fused capitalism meet in the distance in this weird way that I haven't really figured out for myself yet. But I do know that over and over again, I I I bump into people, you know, who who essentially say, we have always assumed in the United States that our model is the model. And, and, you know, there's that phrase, Theodore Parker originated it, but Martin Luther King said it, right? The, mm-hmm. the more luck of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Obama used to say it a lot. You spend some time with behavioral scientists, political scientists, people actually study this stuff, and they'll say, Mm-mm, no, we don't know that to be true. The moral arc of, of the universe is so long, and we've been on it only very briefly. We don't know which way it bends. We don't even know if it's an arc. You know, they are not optimistic about this stuff. It is all an experiment. And so I do not think it is in any way a foregone conclusion that our way of life and how we deploy technology and the sorts of conversations that you and I are having tonight are, are a natural thing, you know, that's going to take place all around the world. You know, it could very easily go the other way. So, you know, I, I don't know. All I know is, that, yeah, I, it, that is such a minefield. I, it's so complicated to think about. And I, I, I wish I was asking you the questions about it because I don't know the answers to that one. <laughs> well, this is why I get to ask the questions because yeah. I think we're all trying to figure it out, right? But at yeah. the same time, you know, like some of the stuff that I struggle with, honestly, here is, you know, I, I think like, let's just take a look at the Google Maven project, the one you referred to before, yes. which is also this one of surveillance. And on one side in these surveillance systems, you have a human who's sitting in a screen who's trying to track a person. And if they get distracted because somebody asked somebody and then now they're following the wrong person, that may result in somebody deploying, you know, I don't know, in a drone or something that, that takes out somebody who's innocent. Mm-hmm. And so could the computer, is, is a computer there also to fire us out of jobs that we find so boring Mm. that we are bad at them and result in an error. I'm thinking about the nurse who mistypes the diabetes, the insulin number or fat fingers. It just because she's so tired because she's working, taking care of 50 COVID patients. And and, and now this person is getting the wrong thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I, you know, for me, I think all things being equal, you know, I was talking to an organizational psychologist who was basically saying, yeah, if you, you know, I was asking, are you in favor of using automated systems to find candidates for jobs and screen them and the rest of it? And she said, you know, if it replaces the racist instincts of some, you know, uh, longstanding hiring manager who's been bringing his racism to it for years. Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, I, she was saying, I don't think that, you know, the, it is, it is as simple as swapping the judgment of one out for the judgment of the other, because along with this is this blindness to all of these different things. And this is me talking now. I mean, you know, the unique human vulnerability to believing systems we do not understand, right? There, in a, there was a recent study of all of these um, high level CTOs uh, at these, some of the biggest companies in the world. And they were asked, um, you know, how often are you use, relying on AI to make important decisions? And they were like, all, you know, all the tests, like 75% or something crazy. And then they said, you know, how many of you can actually explain how the systems work? Almost nobody has any idea how these systems are arriving at the decisions they are. And to what extent are you worried about that? Not even slightly, you know, like less than a quarter of these guys, and it's mostly guys, of course, uh, you know, care. So, 
it's it, the the problem I think is that in the case of the the exhausted nurse who's going to be replaced by the system, excellent. That would be great if the pattern of history were that we then gave more time to that nurse to do her job better, to do his job better. That's not how we tend to use this stuff. We we cut that nursing staff down to two, right? And then we use those automated systems. So we, I think we have to build some values and emotions into how we make these decisions as opposed to just doing them for efficiency and better accuracy, because, you know, it is, it is going to be necessary. And I will say, uh, sorry to take up more time here, but just, you know, I will say there have been some instances in which we have done that as a country. So for instance, you know, uh, backup cameras, um, uh, there's a, a physician who accidentally uh, backed over his child. It's the most terrible story. And he gave all of this congressional testimony about it. And eventually after a long battle, it is now the case that if you buy a new car in the United States, you have to, the car has to have a backup camera in it. And you're paying about $1,200 more per vehicle for this. And that is because about 60 kids a year were being run over typically by their parents. The efficiency model and the, you know, the math would suggest, well, that's not very many kids. But we as a country can agree that that is totally unacceptable and that we can agree that we can out, we should solve that problem. And sen- the senators could, for whatever reason, they got together. It was a bipartisan effort and they made it happen. And today that doesn't, you know, those numbers have dropped to almost nothing. So we can make decisions on the basis of things other than efficiency. And we're really going to have to, because the temptation to just do it because it saves you a few nurses is going to be the thing that drives the value proposition for so long. And we need to stop thinking about it that way, I think. It's it's so, it's so good. It brings up two sort of memories of mine. One is the uh, President Obama's Precision Medicine Initiative. Uh, yeah. And the argument that I think really got the president, President Obama, over the line on it and realizing why he wanted a data scientist to really run this was the only way we're going to go after long these long term genetic issues that sort of cropped up in the, in the, in the, that we call N of one, these rare diseases is if we make this a data problem and we're able to kind of, instead of just having hypotheses out there and going and building these very complex tests, kind of going, wait, isn't that interesting? We're seeing this correlation here of cancers, uh, um, a population just having cancer. We should go study that. You know, there's other one that, that comes to mind is early in my career um, in national security was I was talking to this general and we were building these detectors after 9-11 to, to, to you know, basically tell if somebody was bringing in something that had a like a dirty bomb. Mm. And, you know, we had all this pretty sophisticated stuff and, and graphs and charts and everything. And the general pulled me aside, and said, son, you ever work with a Marine? I was like, no, sir. <laughs> said the light is either red yeah, right. or green. Yeah. And he just turned and walked away. Now, my apologies to my, my, my Marine friends, but, but it raises this other point that you're talking about. And so I want to use this as a jumping off point because we're getting a number of really great questions here. Uh, and taking those two examples back to the issue of racism and the racial mm. reckoning we have, because we got a couple dimensions there that I'd love your take on one side. We have some communities that are saying, yeah, put license plate readers all up my, over my neighborhood because we want, what do I have to hide? What do I have to hide? But there's, Mm -hmm. there's clear bias and bending that, that moral arc there. We have people using facial recognition in fair protests. We also have the AI systems that are, and who designs these, but also was commented in, in one of these comments, uh, somebody pointed out here is, thank you so much for speaking on this issue. As a lawyer, I noticed that most judges are irritated when a defense counsel even suggests that our systematic way of doing these things should not be challenged. And that the judiciary is starting to use bail calculators, as you talked yep. about, that have yep. been proven to be racist. So mm. I, th- I bring up all of these things because it's such a wide area. How do you how do you get your head around this? Yeah, yeah. So there are so many dimensions to it, as you as you say, and you know, to me. And thank you so much for that question, whoever brought that in. So the law is such an interesting one because it, that is, I mean, there is there is no better example of that slow, sorry, this said slow thinking brain, right? The, the slow thinking 
brain in which we are policed by people we've never met and we try to create these laws we all agree on and you know i mean our instinctive snake detection systems were not capable of that and so it's a, it is a credit to our species that we're able to do that my dad always makes the point you know that when we when we drive on the highway that we manage to keep our lane and not kill each other is just a miracle and it's absolutely correct so the fact that in the law we're thinking here about this is so interesting. So there's a, a, a superior court judge uh, named Tino Cuellar, um, who is now running uh, an institute and is a very smart guy. He was at Stanford uh, when I was doing a fellowship there. And he said to me, you know, you could make the law so much more efficient. It would be possible to do it. We, you know, he said, for instance, entering a guilty plea is such a pain. You got to fill out all these forms and you got to do this and you got to do that. You got to, you know, think it through and we could make it a swipe left thing. You could make it, you know, such an easy thing. He's like, but we have a principle that we call weak perfection. And it is the idea that you build a system intentionally awkward so that people have to think about it. Because with a guilty plea or not guilty plea, that's going to change your life. You don't get to take it back. You know, it's one of the biggest decisions you'll ever make. And so we cannot make it as simple as ordering from Grubhub. We need to keep it hard. We need to do that so that people bring them their best selves to it. So in this particular question of, you know, uh, you know, judges don't like having something like systemic inequality brought up. I know. I mean, I have this whole section of the book that for me was the really mind blowing one for me, which was getting into the world of online casino simulators. I've mentioned them a few times here because they're the big bugaboo for me. These absolutely cynical predatory companies that, that use the circuitry of addiction and and geo fencing and targeting and you know distressed lines of credit and all the other stuff you can find through data to pinpoint people they think are going to get addicted and what's so interesting is that for years i was talking to this one uh, lawyer who for years has been trying to sue on behalf of these people who lose their life savings to these companies like 499 at a time and uh he was laughed out of court for years because the judges would say I'm not calculating, this is, you know, what are you talking about loss, you know, losses, these people are suckers, you know, and I've had many people in my reporting on this for NBC also say, you know, these people are suckers and they get whatever they deserve as they're playing a fool's game. But recently, they've started winning. These law, this law firm has begun winning. They just did a $150 million settlement with one of these companies because they were able to show in the data that these companies know exactly how addicted these people are and are finding them on that basis. And so I think if you can get better, if we can as a society get better at deploying the same pattern recognition systems that we're using to ensnare people to instead prove the existence of systemic racism, the way that redlining and systemic discrimination has made its way into all these other things, right? I think we could get to a place where you could actually make a case in court. You know, I know people are very cynical about the role of, of trial attorneys and, and litigation and this stuff. But that's why we don't smoke cigarettes anymore. You know, and I think that that, that suing the bejesus out of people is part of how we're going to get through this. And, and that is, that's for me, I, I hold I'm, I'm clinging to that one, because I think that's going to be a big part of this. Um, so please make sure to get your questions in here in the chat. Uh, this raises another good one that was on my list of things to talk about, and I'm glad a number of people have brought this up also, which is misinformation. Yeah. Where we are as a country in people going down into conspiracies and getting sucked into things, whether it's vaccinations or January 6th and the insurrection yeah. and people's head getting turned around. What's the role of technology in this? And, and you know, yeah. one side of it is people are like, you know, we have this culture in America of, you know, if you're not tough enough, addiction is your fault. And then we have this other side of, you know, oh, it's not it's not them. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. You know, uh, so so. I, I've been so lucky to be in touch with people who, you know, to work alongside and have for this book interviewed people who really specialize in this, in, 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 in thinking not just about misinformation, which is itself such a problem, but also the grift, which is how I've thought to be taught, you know, is how I've taught to be thought of, to think about it, involved in misinformation, the small time grifters who make money off of misinformation. So around January 6th, for instance, I spent that day um, monitoring all of the online streaming 
folks, typically on YouTube, who were streaming from the Capitol. And they're pulling in the feeds, the live feeds of on people's phones, which of course have gotten so many of those people arrested. Um, uh, and at the top of the YouTube screen, if you have a certain number of subscribers, you're allowed to institute what's called a super chat, which allows you to charge money for pinning somebody's comment to the top of the window for a few minutes. And you can set whatever price you want. YouTube, of course, takes a percentage of that and it's 20 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever, you know, hundred bucks. And I just watching people bing, 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 you know, they're making, you know, a few thousand bucks a minute. Now, is that a, a few thousand bucks a minute live streaming live streaming of the seat of democracy, uh, the, an insurrection <laughs> at the you Capitol. You can't make this up right? in a plot. And you a cannot movie. make it up. Exactly. You would not believe it if you saw it. So it is, it is, it is uh yeah, it's idiocracy, but not funny. Right. It is, it is. And, and, and so that profit incentive is a huge driver of this. When I go cover um, you know, when I was covering a lot of the stop the steal protest rallies at NBC, I would go see these people there who are streaming live. And it's so interesting because they look sort of to a space alien, they might look like their job is the same as mine. They've got lights, their hair's done, they're doing their makeup, right? And then they go live, but these people are leading the chant. And when you look at their, their Instagram feed or you look at their super chat on YouTube, you can see they're making money in that moment. Now I am also being paid to cover this, but I don't get paid more per comment. You know what I'm saying? Like uh, the, the well, you have a, you have, a, you have a, you have an industry behind you, ideally called journalistic eth ethics. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And I get fired if I make it up, if right. I lie, I get fired. So, so there's some guardrails around it, but anyway, that, that for me, learning the grift was really powerful. And then there's a very brilliant woman named Nandi Jamini who, who runs something called check my ads. Uh, and, uh, she was the co-founder of Sleeping Giants, you're probably familiar with. And, and she has been doing all of this research about the ways in which online advertising funds um, all of these uh, very scary publishers of all kinds of scary stuff. And um, she turned me on to the research that, that really sort of set her on her path, which showed that there are all kinds of blacklist services that will spike certain published articles against basically make it such that advertisers won't be, you know, do, who don't want to be publishing or advertising next to sensitive topics won't be published next to certain news articles. And she discovered that in fact, or the research actually discovered that it is people covering really important stuff that are being blacklisted off of these lists such that some Pulitzer Prize winning brilliant people at the New York Times, for instance, were not, no online advertising was appearing next to their work. So it's actually costing the New York Times money to run that kind of really important journalism. Mm -hmm. So for me, right, when I, when I think about misinformation, again, I'm thinking, okay, there is a system here, both of pattern, dumb pattern recognition that nobody is equipped to, to question, and incentive structures that is fueling this stuff. It, I, you know, I also blame as much as the next person, our tendency to just try and be tribal and crass and get attention. The attention economy is a really important part of this, all that stuff. But there's some specific machinery in there that I think we should be starting to think about how we're going to take a hammer to it. I mean, you, yeah, one of the ones I will highlight because this is how much I, I enjoyed the book here it is, I think it's in chapter two, you talk about this experiments of what happened when kids are just basically told they're on the you know, green team versus the orange yeah. team and what affiliation does as a powerful, I mean, psychological motivator. You know, and it gets me to one of these the questions that's in here is, and almost like the way I almost want to describe it is, is and once you, could you talk about this with addiction of people have too much time on their hands because mm -hmm. technology is freeing them up. They can take drugs, get into the stupor and detach from the world. Same thing happens with gambling. You see mm -hmm. a version of that. You see a version of this with, uh, um, as with people who don't have 
alternatives to spend their time on work or other things, getting into these forums where they get um, they get radicalized, not just mm. here in the United States. We see it around the world. Yep. And it's almost this version of like, we're using technology to free ourselves up from time. But then, you know, when time comes together, you know, your free time plus despair, the note I wrote is free time plus despair equals opportunity to take advantage of people and technology accelerates it. Yeah. It is... I'd love for your reaction to that. Yeah. So I, I, yeah, I, I, I absolutely, I'm very interested about what you say. I, I'm not sure that I blame free time as much as I blame despair in, mm. in the equation that you have there. And I also think that social isolation is a huge part of that as well. So one of the common threads, you know, there in the book, there's a 14 year old kid um, who lost his mom and was deeply isolated in uh, Florida, who wound up going down this rabbit hole uh, of, of race, quote unquote, race realism and all of this stuff and wound up adhering to all kinds of white supremacist He's ideology. He's a Muslim, right? And he turned out to be Muslim. <laughs> That's right. He was a, his parents were Bosnian Muslims who escaped genocide. And he nonetheless wound up down this rabbit hole and became a, you know, somebody who, who believes in white supremacy. So that kid couldn't have been sadder or lonelier than, than he was. He was deeply looking for connection and was not able to find it. Another character who, you know, fell prey to uh, online casino uh, uh, simulators, also a deeply lonely and, and sad person. And here's the thing is I, you know, what I'm starting to understand is that there are marketing mechanisms out there that find people who exhibit those conditions. You know, I don't know about you, but a lot of my pandemic, as soon as I turned in the book anyway, I went hard at TikTok for a while and would doom scroll my way through hours of it until, and here's what happens when you get to a certain point in TikTok, until a video comes up that says, you've been scrolling really fast, you should slow down. There's like a little, little warning that says, you've been going too fast, slow down. And then eventually it'll say, you've been looking at videos for quite a while, you wanna take a break? Meanwhile, every ad I get is for ADHD medication. Right. And I'm sure anyone out there listening to this who's been on TikTok recently has gotten these ads as well. Huge amounts of ADHD medication. Now, maybe everybody's getting that. Maybe that's just a blanket kind of advertising campaign. I don't think so. I think that inside that company, there are there is a pattern recognition system that says this guy is exhibiting the classic signs of X, Y, and Z, serve him an ADHD ad. You know, it is not just the affinities that we have and the hobbies we exhibit and what we post about. It is the way we behave that is showing our inner state. And I think that we are being analyzed in that way. That is the loop, right? That's what's starting to grab us. Um, and as they get better at noticing that I'm ADHD, I'm not actually a diagnosed ADHD people. And there's, and there's a whole problem with, with advertising ADHD to people who have not been clinically diagnosed, but putting all that aside, the qualities they have spotted in me, and are feeding me information as a result. I have to, basically the way TikTok is for me, it's like doing drugs. I do it for a couple of months and then I have to erase it off my phone because I cannot control myself with that app. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, there's an inner state being analyzed here um, that I think is a, is a huge part of this. And, uh, you know, maybe it is extra time on our hands, but I don't know about you, like half of Americans can't put together an extra $400 in an emergency right now. I don't right. think time is our problem, you hmm. know? Well, um I've, I've tried to layer in a number of the questions. There's so many more that have come in that are, that are amazing. I hope somebody, people will uh, keep putting them in here. The, uh, maybe to capture a couple more of these is, it's almost like I, I might describe these as, are you optimist or a pessimist? No, I know. I'm a weird, I'm <laughs> and it's weird almost like, this What stuff. do we do about this? What, what are we going to do, Jake? I know. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. I think we're going to, first of all, need to look deep inside these companies and make them civilly and maybe even criminally liable for uh, the ways in which they've tried to manipulate our behavior. I think that it's going to start costing these companies money. Right now, human attention is treated as this kind of ephemeral thing. There's, it's endless, you know, um, but, you know, people smarter than me have been, you know, saying, no, 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 it is like mining, and we need to regulate it. Not that we do a great job of regulating mining, but we need to get into to these companies, I think probably through lawsuits and begin showing what they are what knowing and doing. Now that's, the, that's for me the, the first step. But I also think there needs to be 
a recognition that all of that, it's like <sighs> Star Wars. We're watching, you know, when I watch Star Wars these days and Han Solo is being told by C-3PO, never tell me the odds, you know, leave me alone, nerd, right? He's always saying, you know, don't tell me, you know, oh, you know, uh, Captain Solo, it, the chances of survival are 10,566 to one, right? And he says, never tell me the odds. Listen to C-3PO. C-3PO should be the hero of that movie because mm -hmm. he's right. Should not do this, you know? And our whole culture is geared and has been since the 19th century uh, on this idea of rugged individualism, growth at all costs is good. We're going out to the West and, and, and you know, uh, uh, pioneering our way out to a better life, you know, as opposed to thinking as a community about how are we going to support one another? And what if it all goes wrong? And, and, and for me, a big part of that is going to have to be making it socially acceptable to say, here are my mental predilections. So for me, I try. I tell anybody who who you know wants to talk to me about it. Like I am, uh, I, I no longer drink. I'm a. Uh, I don't. I think it's unfair to, to people who suffered from alcoholism to refer to myself as a as an alcoholic. I'm not sure I, I fall fully into that category, but I absolutely cannot drink. I have learned that about myself, and I have also learned as a result that when people say to me, "Hey, let's meet up and go to a bar," I say to them, "No, <laughs> I I would love to take a walk with you." I would love to do this other thing, but I cannot go to a bar with you. I used to drink and I don't anymore. And that's going to mess me up, right? Being able to say, TikTok has got me, right? Being able to say, I'm having trouble with this thing, you know, making it socially acceptable to look at the odds, right? To listen to C-3PO, I think is going to be a really important thing. And then the last thing is, I think we need to stop letting culture, the modern culture as it's being dictated by some of the biggest companies, um, tell us our norms, so for me right now, I'm in the process at the school that I'm that my children are at of creating a pact with all the, the parents in the grades that we are in to not give our children personal smartphones until they enter high school at the very earliest. And I can't tell you how complicated that conversation is. It's a very hard thing to have that conversation because it involves admitting to your own difficult relationship with smartphones. The, you got to sort of admit as a parent that you don't have any idea what your kid is really doing with them and what that might be. And that you may not even know your kid fundamentally at all. You know, it's a really hard conversation, but we have managed to get through it. And in fact, I'm, I'm on the hook right now for being the guy who's supposed to write up the new revised pledge after a huge amount of really smart input. Um, it makes my palms sweat to realize that I am, I'm on the hook for that right now, but you know, it's going to require communities coming together and saying, nope, Nope, I'm not going to do that because, you know, the statistics show that the vast majority of parents get their cues about what's an appropriate use of technology from the ads for technology, from a cutesy Alexa ads, you know, in which the kid and the dog, you know, trigger Alexa by accident is not adorable. Right. You know, they're normalizing behavior that we have not actually signed off on. And I think that we should, we need to start coming up with some civic structures for saying no, it's too, and we're too quick to say, oh, don't be a Luddite, right? As if that's some sort of terrible thing. You know, if you read up on the Luddites, they're a pretty interesting group. That's pretty interesting, you know? And I, I'm not saying we need to kick it all out of our lives. I love being here with you tonight, DJ, in this way. This is an incredible empowerment of our uh, slow thinking brain you and I are doing right now. Fantastic. But we have to recognize the profit motive, the power the, you know, the, the way it's going to feel inexorable as pattern recognition systems make their way into our lives and that we have to come up with some civic structures for, for pushing back on them. And I think we can, we've done it before. We're going to do it again. I just think we need to speed it up a little bit. <laughs> In fact, it's why the Commonwealth, the, the Commonwealth club exists is, is to right. foster this slow thinking and, and dialogue on, on all sides. You know, one mm -hmm. of the questions that's, that's come up here is, is might be roughly described as, um, the question of diversity in the workforce, does this just take care of the problem, especially with some of the hiring issues or implicit um, bias? And as you looked across uh, the landscape, what's your take on, on that as, as uh, a solution? I, I do. I absolutely, I mean, it's a, it'd be a great start. I think that'd be really good, you know, and I, I've had the privilege of working in journalism um, in some uh, extraordinarily diverse uh, newsrooms. Uh, I've, I've, of course, worked in some that were not. And, and you know, 
it is a it is a an incredibly powerful thing to have a huge number of people from a wide variety of backgrounds come together. And so, and so, yes, we should absolutely start with that. I'd like to give women a shot at running the world for a while. I think we've men have messed it up pretty good. And so I think women should take a shot at it for, for I'd like to give them the stick for 400 years, please. Um, plus, but, but, you know, here, so here was an episode that I, I experienced, uh, um, at one point I was at a, a, a meeting between a bunch of behavioral scientists, like tried and true academics, and then some people working on what they said was going to be a, 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 um, system for, uh, basically sussing out the morality of stuff, an AI system for that. And the designer of that system was standing there giving a presentation on how it would work. We're going to have uh, a, a bunch of humans fill out these value propositions. It would never be appropriate for me and my coworker to do X. And then we'll have humans fill them out a certain number of times. Um, and then using the patterns in that, an AI system will pick up the patterns in human morality. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how we will arrive at a set of universal human values. And now I'll take your questions, he said. And and all the behavioral scientists raised their hands. <laughs> Everybody in the room raised their hands. <laughs> and they very politely, you know, held them there. And the, the pol a political scientist went first and she said, I just have three questions. What is universal? What is human? And what are values? And then the whole meeting imploded and it all <laughs> fell apart, right? And listening to these two groups of people speak to one another and, and have such a hard time of it was so fascinating and so interesting and so helpful because it made you realize, I mean, all too often, I think companies are hiring in behavioral scientists to ratify and, and make more effective their work, but very rarely are they, are they hiring them in to say, you know, my grandfather had a fantastic phrase. He would listen carefully to somebody's idea and he'd say, that is a wonderful idea. Let's not do it, right? There's nobody in the room typically that's saying that because that's not how, you know, we don't reward that in, in this country, you know? Um, and so I think among the many uh, variables we should make part of diversity. And, and again, I think that just just diversifying the backgrounds of the people would be a fantastic start. Um, but I also think bringing in people whose job it is not to say yes, you know, would be helpful in a, in a, that would be a really powerful thing. I think. Mm -hmm. One of the things you, you highlight in the book, I, I thought was as you're interviewing all these people was the number of people who effectively said, I'm a technologist. That's a decision for policymakers. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's such a thing. Speaking of racism, right in the workplace. So I, I was, I had a, a, or you know, in these products, um, you know, and I should tip my hat here first of all to you know people like Temnit Jebru, Joy Bolanri, who are you know incredible thinkers on this stuff and really have gotten the world thinking about racism in these products. So I I was trying to find. Uh, places where people had tried to incorporate some understanding of systemic inequality into their products. And I had heard a rumor that this one data group inside a company um, that makes loans using AI, um, that they'd been experimenting with some stuff. And so I, I got a hold of this data scientist who used to work there. And I said, I understand you guys were doing these experiments and that sounds really interesting. Like you were sort of trying to get on the right side of history. And, and he was so interesting to talk to because he basically said, well, we played with that for a moment. He was very cagey with me. He was like, we played with that for a moment, um, but we realized very quickly that it would be deeply unethical for us to put our thumb on the scale of loan making. Um, it would be, uh, you know, it would be a disservice to our shareholders, which is an argument you hear a lot. We're just here to, you know, provide value to our shareholders. Um, and it would require putting our thumb so thoroughly on the scale, we'd have to press so hard to uh, counteract uh, historic patterns of um, uh, of loan paybacks based on race um, that it would he basically said it would be unethical. It was really interesting. And so there is a and this is that libertarian thing of it is our responsibility is only to the shareholders and the problems are just you know that the data wasn't enough or you know I think there's a new strain of kind of uh, of uh, reformist thinking about technology in which people say well it's a design problem. And if we just design the systems better, we'll do better. That tends to come from foreign designers. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and I think all of that stuff is a trap and we, we need to, you know, uh, you know, for me, I'd like to give, maybe we could do like a five-year moratorium on AI and just give it to social scientists and say, why don't you find and prove the patterns in human inequality for a while? And then we're going to like, and then that'll be the data set. And we'll use that for a while, you know, see if that's mm -hmm. going. I've got all these academics who have these incredible uh, uh, processes and theories and, and so forth, who lack the methodology to make it work. If you gave the power, the, the processing horsepower that a company right now is sicking on making people addicted to a product on something like, why has law historically fallen on disenfranchised communities heavier than it does on people like me? I mean, we could really do have a transformative effect. So, so uh, yes, diversity, uh, super yeah. important. I'm not sure so I answered your things. question there, but yes. Well, yes. I, I mean, it's you, what you're raising is, I mean, it's honestly why to your point, like how much actually needs to be investigated into these loops and honestly, what's at stake. Uh, and and yeah. what I, I think of, of when I, both read this book in our conversation. I want to thank you for the for writing it and coming here to the Commonwealth Club because it 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 is a, a wake up call for us to really make sure that we are asking ourselves what is happening in this loop and how do we intercede to make sure the technology works for us rather than against us. Um, unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> we could go on for easily many more hours. I want to thank everyone who's joined us today, all the questions, there's so much more. I hope those of you that we did not get to your questions, or if I didn't characterize them correctly, you will follow up uh, not only by reading Jake's uh, new book, The Loop, uh, uh, How Technology is Creating a World Without Choices and How to Fight Back. Uh, you also can follow him on Twitter, as I mentioned earlier, at by Jacob Award, and uh, you can he'll respond to you there. Uh, I mean, that's just, thank you. It's so important. So timely. Uh, let me just say, let me just say really quickly that I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. You were one of the very first people when I was a journalist who knew nothing about this or how to even begin thinking about it. You turned me on to all sorts of interesting people and all sorts of interesting ideas. Um, you, you know, really helped me refine my thinking about this. And so, uh, it was a real honor to be with you tonight. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for everyone else out there. This program and others like it will soon be found on Commonwealth, the Commonwealth Club's website, www.commonwealthclub.org. I'm DJ Patil, and this Commonwealth Club program is now adjourned. <laughs>